Hi, I'm Ayça Elemdoroğlu. I'm the Associate Director of the Program on Turkey and a Research Scholar at the Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. Welcome to the Imagine a World podcast from Knight Hennessy Scholars. We are here to give you a glimpse into the Knight Hennessy Scholar community of graduate students spanning all seven Stanford schools, including business, education, engineering, humanities, law, medicine, and sustainability. In each episode, we talk with scholars about the world they imagine and what they are doing to bring it to life. Today, you'll be hearing from Aicha Alamdorolu. Associate Director of the Program on Turkey and Research Scholar at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. During our conversation, you'll hear about the Knight Hennessy Global Study Trip, Aicha's background in political sociology, what she hopes scholars will learn from our global study trip in Turkey, and so much more. Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome to another episode of the Imagine the World podcast. I am your host, Willie Thompson, and we're doing a little something different today with this episode. As you heard in the intro, it's not a Knight Hennessy scholar, but it's a scholar nonetheless who's joining us on this episode. And that is our very own Dr. Aicha. We're going to talk a lot about why we're doing this episode a little bit differently. But before I get into that, I want to ask... How are you doing? How's life? Good, good. Yeah, we're having fun. <laughs> yeah, we are having fun. For those of y'all who might be unaware, uh, we're recording this episode right now in Turkey, actually. So Dr. Aisha is someone who has been joining us on a 10-day trip, I think, in total to Turkey. And it's part of the global study trip here at Night Hennessy Scholars. And in terms of context, this is a trip where... Every Night Hennessy Scholar gets one opportunity uh, over the years of their funding to go on a trip to somewhere in the world. And so we get to study and learn from scholars um, like Dr. Aicha, uh, as well as see places that have either piqued our imaginations or we haven't had a chance to explore. And so um, in the past, Night Hennessy's done trips to Alaska, also done trips to Chile and South Africa, to name a few. And I got a chance to do the trip with Turkey. And so we thought, why not give you all a chance to see what it's like to be on one of these trips? All that being said, before we even get to the trip, which has been amazing, by the way, I just want to thank you for showing up and, and quizzing us to make sure we're we're knowledgeable people about the country we're exploring. Yeah, yeah, before I take you here, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly, yeah. But before we get into that, I actually want to know more about you and your story. So I remember the first time we were introduced to you in our pre-orientation session, you were introduced to us as a political sociologist, which I thought was really cool. And you gave a little bit of context around how you got to Stanford, but that's something we do with all of our guests, and I love to do with you too, is to understand the world you were born into and experienced. And so I want to understand from you, like, how did you get to Stanford? How did you start studying political sociology? You were you know, you mentioned being born and raised for the most part in Turkey. And so I'd love to just get a little bit of your backstory before we even talk about the trip we're on. Sure. It's a long story, <laughs> but I was born in Ankara and I grew up there. And until I was 25, I lived there. I was doing my PhD. So I studied political science at the Middle East Technical University as well as sociology. And then I did my master's in Bilkent University, a neighboring university in Ankara in political science. And then I was basically, I continued my PhD there. Mm -hmm. But then I got this really nice fellowship from the Turkish uh, government to go abroad. And at that time, I was studying this subject about nationalism and human body and eugenics, those kind of issues. Mm -hmm. So I went to study with a, with a sociologist at Cambridge during uh, my PhD in Turkey. But then I really like being in Cambridge and I was like, oh, maybe I should do my PhD here. So I started a new PhD there, not 
political science, but sociology this time. I did that for a while. And part of that fellowship was for me to come back to Turkey and be a professor exactly at the college that I, I, I graduated from, Middle East Technical University. We call it the MIT of the Middle East. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but then... Uh, develop in the way that I wasn't expecting. Mm -hmm. I met this uh, young uh, American scientist at Cambridge, whom I fell in love with, and then we he wanted to move back to the U.S. And basically following him to, all the way to the West Coast. Yeah, that's how I got to Stanford. And I know you were initially at Stanford, and then you lived in, uh -huh. in Evanston at Northwestern. Yeah. And then you came back to Stanford, too. Yes. I was still doing my PhD when we moved to Palo Alto. And then when I finished it, I did a year of postdoc in the anthropology department and then three years in the Thinking Matters program. It was called then Thinking Matters. I think it's uh, now, it's just an introductory study. It's basically teaching the freshmen mm -hmm. or frosh. And then I was like looking at uh, all the options and jobs around the country. And I got this really nice job at Northwestern as an assistant professor of research sociology in, mm -hmm. in the sociology department. And then also like um, a chance to direct the program on Turkey there okay. at Northwestern. And they have a nice program in the Global Studies Institute. Yeah, I did that for five years. And then it was very difficult. Like, I mean, it wasn't that difficult, but there was a point where I was like, it was hard to continue flying back and forth between Palo Alto and, Evan, you know, Chicago, right. San Francisco and Chicago. So just two months before the pandemic started in March 2020, I moved to Palo Alto, to, uh, you know, taking this job as the associate director of program on Turkey, as well as a research scholar. Got it. And the timing seemed to have worked out quite well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The timing was, uh, I was lucky, yeah, that yeah. I could do the move just before. Something I want to ask more about your interest in, in political science and sociology and, and how you got started there. What was it about political science? Like, what were you experiencing that led you down the path towards academia? I, we, we talk a lot with our, my fellow scholars who are in PhD programs and how, you know, that's like, like you don't flirt with a PhD, like that's a commitment, right? And so, like, what, what were you experiencing and seeing and, and wanting to observe that led you to pursue that field? I grew up in, in Turkey um, during the 1980s, and that had a meaning, which was like just right after the 1980 coup, military coup, mm -hmm. there was a restructuring of the education. And it was very like the, it, my, the education I got was very good. I went to a private school, thanks to my parents, but it was very dry in, in terms of like how we study history, how we studied geography mm -hmm. and all that. I wasn't necessarily a very good student. I was okay. So I took the national university exam and then I, um, you know, get a chance to go to the Middle East Technical University. And that's for and, undergrad, right? Uh, yeah, that's okay. for my undergrad. And I just loved it. Mm. I just loved everything. I just loved the history of politics. Uh, I loved political theory. I loved uh, sociology, critical thinking. It just like... I felt like I was reborn, you know, like with a mind, like critical mind, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most of my friends actually went to work in banks, auditing firms or bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want to stop research and reading. Mm -hmm. So that's how I uh, become an, became an academic and how I'm still in, working in the university. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's a really cool story. And it's interesting to hear you talk about your experience in the like a context of what Turkey was going through and how mm -hmm. your experience in like a a more it sounds like more rigid sort of education system and how you are able to mm -hmm. break out into like more like a free form I guess like form of like thinking mm -hmm. and like it's really cool. Before we get to the trip, because I think there's we were talking about this. I think I feel like the days blend together when you're on these like multiple day like double digit hour trips. But we were talking over lunch about some of the research you're planning on doing here like you know we're kind of doing this episode while we're not in Istanbul while we're um we're in a chocolate for a couple of days mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you're mentioning like you're just so busy going back and forth like setting up research so you've got a list a publication list that's 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 longer than the Bosphorus at this point so instead of talking about all of your research you've done like I'd love if you could share a little bit about what you're trying to set up in and research now 
in Turkey and, and what you're trying to see there? I have a couple of projects going, but let's start with the one that I think you're referring to is the, so Turkey had a really interesting cycle of elections in the last year. Mm -hmm. So in 2023, we had the general elections where the opposition lost by a couple of percentage points. And then in the local elections in like less than a year after, they won big time. So this particular research that I think you are referring to is about like understanding what happened in between and mm -hmm. how the opposition won in Turkey in the taking over many municipalities from the governing party. So we have a like a four people team. And like actually we we started as just me, but then we grow to become a four people team and we're basically studying this question in like six towns okay. or all around Turkey picked from different uh, locations and we're trying to understand how, what happened in these places because mm. these some of these places are never elected the Republican People's Party the opposition party mm -hmm. in their history some haven't elected the People's Party for 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. So the question is like, what happened? But then the second part of research is about would they be able to keep, hold on to these places? Mm -hmm. Like, can we, how are they doing? How are they governing in these um, uh, municipalities? Mm -hmm. And can we predict that they will continue to win elections? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the research that, I have to actively, you know, come back <laughs> and, and, and do in the next uh, year. Yeah, that was the one we were talking about because it was, when I, even when I heard you talking about it, it reminded me of, and I believe I said this at lunch, it just reminded me of what we saw in the U.S. around, you know, people who voted for President Obama in 2012 and voted for President Trump in 2016 and then who maybe, like, didn't vote, <laughs> you know. I like It's almost like flip-flopping between, like, candidates or, like, the false red wave that that we thought we'd have in 2022. So I thought that was really interesting. I can wait to see what the research says. Do you have any guesses or predictions or are you just going to wait to see what the data says or the data say rather? There are two main ideas. One or things that we're observing. Uh, one is that it's the weakening of the governing party, mm -hmm. but then the opposition party did some things different this time. Mm, okay. So it's a combination of both factors. Okay. I can go into detail about what they did different. That's but, my oh, next question. But we have to like see it in each of these towns, like how that played out. Got it. And if, yeah, if you're uh, curious about what they did different, is like, I think they were more based their decisions to who they feel in different localities, mm -hmm. like making actually sure that they have some understanding of what the public wants in those places oh, interesting. doing some research i think maybe traditionally the party functioned in a way that whoever was like had money in that particular locality or who have been in the party organization for many years the party trusts those people uh, but when you trust a certain cadre of people they're not always very good at reading what's going on in the society, what mm. the demands are. Uh, so they may move away from being representative of their, um, you know, constituencies. Right. And I think this time the party was more careful about who they field. Got it. Well, I'll be really excited to hear more about where that research shows up. Because I know these research projects have like a pretty long tail, right? So it might take, you know, a yeah, couple of years yeah. or something. So until. this one has two phases. One okay. is that we're going to do next year, okay. uh, 2025. And then we will, you know, release our, I mean, we'll release our report. But then the idea is like to do a second phase of the, the research close to when these municipalities, mm -hmm. you know, mayors and terms end, yep. you know, so in two, three years, we'll do another phase and to see like if they're doing well. Mm -hmm. Got it. Well, cool. Well, thank you for giving that context. And before I talk about our trip specifically, we talked a lot about your research, talked a little bit about what got you into the field, into academia, being a researcher. One thing we do a lot on the podcast that we haven't done in this setting, but I want to maybe spend a little time talking through is the name of the podcast is you know, Imagine a World. And 
a lot of times we talk to people about like the world they imagine and how what they're doing influences the ideas and the ways in which they view futures. Mm -hmm. What would you hope and imagine will be different about the world as a result of the research and the the work that you're doing? It depends on the particular research project that I take on. Mm -hmm. Some research projects I um, really target, you know, Turkey and the sort of ways of thinking about things in Turkey. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I try to maybe question that and bring in new evidence to challenge it, to show people that that sort of common narrative that they use or the dominant narrative that we sort of resort to may not reveal the truth or may not Mm. be about the truth. The reality may be a little bit more complex than how they see it. If you're thinking about this other project about the elections and the why opposition won, then obviously I want a more democratic Turkey. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if we understand how different parties or how different voices can excel in the society in one way or another, that will help democratization, Mm -hmm. right? And then, so I want to make sure that we understand so we can repeat that, that Mm -hmm. success, Mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, it depends on the project, but uh, generally the questions that I study are, you know, inequality, authoritarianism, I have a new cool project about the Cold War Turkey, Mm, uh, which I don't want to talk too much now. This is going to be a good exercise in me practicing active listening. So what I heard is you imagine a world where there is, I'm going to name a couple of things. There's a more democratic Turkey, Mm -hmm. a world where there are multiple narratives that allow for complexity. Mm -hmm. And a world where we have a better understanding of how our parties, wherever you are, Turkey, U.S., Mm -hmm. can best serve the interests of the people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, more plurality, you know, like can happen, you know, especially in the authoritarian context, right? Right, right. It's a good experiment to when the opposition finally wins an election, Right. right? And then you want to make sure you understand it, what happened really, so that you could do it again, you know? Right, right. I mean, obviously, like, your ability to win elections is not, like, just dependent on on you, even you do some right things sometimes, you know? Elections play out in different ways. (laughs) Uh, But, yeah. I love that vision. Having now visited one country and lived in another where authoritarianism is the name of the game or can be perceived to be the name of the game. It is cool to sort of think about like what that world could look like. So I appreciate you for sharing that with us. Now we're going to do a little bit of a pivot here. I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that we have these global study trips. They're amazing and eye-opening and edifying. And you're also not a stranger to these global study trips. I mean, you've done, you did another one. Uh, what was that? Was it, was it two years ago? Mm-hmm. You did one two years ago. That was our group's first trip. Not me, by the way. I was not on that trip because <laughs> you can only go on one trip. But you've been on this trip twice now. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering for you, having done it again, what have you been reflecting on and thinking about during our trip so far? So I really like the design of these trips, which I contributed. I mean, I designed the first trip, uh, part of the first trip, right? So these trips are partially visiting historical sites Mm -hmm. in Turkey, specifically Istanbul in the first trip, Mm. you know, from the Byzantine to the Ottoman palaces to contemporary modern art, Mm -hmm. especially in the first trip, the last bit. There's that kind of like more learning about like the history of Mm. Turkey Mm -hmm. through visiting these landmark places Mm -hmm. in Istanbul. And then the second part of the trip is going and talking to various civil society organizations or corporations where students, scholars learn about the struggles in Turkey, how people organize, how people voice their dissent, Mm -hmm. how the media works, how can they organize to Mm -hmm. recreate a context of like independent media 
all those things. So the two parts of the trip, the way we design it, uh, and I designed the second part, mm -hmm. I really like it. And this year, I think the second trip shows me that that's still a good idea, <laughs> you know? Right. So I like that about these, uh, these study trips. This time we added another component to the trip, which is this two day in Chanakkale. Yeah, yeah. uh, this uh, sort of where we visited the first world war war sites, talking about how national identities are created, uh, Turkey's sort of decline of the empire and the, its dissolution, but as well as like we talked about the Australian national identity, New mm -hmm. Zealand nationality, how it's tied to this locality here. We also visited uh, like a Doric and Ionian temple mm -hmm. and we had We have seen, of course, the Troy, the city of Troy, and this beautiful museum. So this trip had this add-on mm -hmm. where we visited another location and came down, all, you know, to Aegean. Yeah, I think this worked very well too. You know, with this add-on visit to Chanakkale and seeing all these incredible places. Yeah, I think the first trip I was like trying to understand. Who are, you know, Knight Hennessy scholars? Why are these people like our Knight Hennessy scholars? What are common about them, right? Mm -mm. In my first trip, it was like only eight people, eight uh, scholars. And we had a, you know, like for seven days, I get to know them quite a bit. And I thought their openness and their curiosity and their trying effort to understand things was really remarkable to mm -hmm. me. And I see this on this trip too, which is really rewarding as a faculty leader to the trip that you're talking to people who have these qualities. So, yeah, those have been my <laughs> thoughts about this trip. For sure. And I would definitely say being able to go, or sorry, being able to, we're not go, we're here now, but being able to come to Chanakale has been really great. And Chanakale has... Yeah, it's included a bunch of stuff that I didn't think I would see. Right, mm -hmm. I didn't think I would see 20 charter buses loaded on a ferry, and yeah. and we'd sail across some water to get to get to Troya, or even to swim in the Aegean, which uh, which wasn't on my bucket list. But I'm glad we got a chance to do it as a group. And and you had a nice jump in the water. I did have a nice jump. I did have a nice jump. Pierce got a good video of me. I think you and Kathy might be the strongest swimmers of the group. So <laughs> <laughs> that was another like new insight there. And we also, I know we have one more organization to visit. Hafiza Marchesi, which you know, I'm really excited to get a chance to speak with them. And for folks who are unfamiliar, they basically work a lot with understanding and reckoning with past violations of human rights. And how do you build like a more robust collective memory and reckoning around those things, which I just think is, is remarkable. We're coming up on time here. There's so many things I could talk to you about and ask you about, but I'll, I'll remain steadfast to, <laughs> to the time we have. And I want to get your take on this final question. And you see, you already noted some of the qualities and traits. I can you know, probably hear Tina Selig smiling and John probably that around the traits you were noticing, because that's a real big part of our, our leadership model here at Night Hennessy. And now that we're ending this on the back end of this trip, what are you hoping that we will get out of trips like these and the things that we'll, we'll take with us and that we'll will stay in our like collective memory in our hearts as we go on to lead lives of consequence. I can't generalize. I mean, I don't know the other trips, but for Turkey trip in like specifically, I guess like maybe three things. One is like expanding your horizons, right? In mm. terms of the food you eat, in terms <laughs> of like the crowds that you can feel comfortable <laughs> yeah. in in terms of like the sounds the visuals the you know the history the how people interact with each other the how the cities are organized you know everything you see you hear you we talked about in this trip so really expanding that mm -hmm. adding it to what you already know mm -hmm. uh, and maybe making connections I mean, the second is, I guess, uh, Turkey is a very complex place, very long history, really complex society, very, at times, difficult political times. And we've talked about those. Right. So just understanding like how things can be complex mm. and difficult to pinpoint. So really appreciating this country's 
you know, long history and difficult history at times, but also like struggles of people uh, in this country now. I think it's, Turkey is a very, very interesting place. I mean, I've lived here, you know, I, I was born, I lived, I study here, but it still like uh, surprises me. And I hope I was able to share some of that enthusiasm and amazement and uh, interest in, in, in Turkey. And then I guess like the last is, um, you know, we... Although different countries like the U.S. and Turkey, although we are allies, you know, right. with an asterisk, perhaps like seeing the common things that we are experiencing, like mm. in terms of like perhaps the democratic decline or, you know, obviously there are different levels to it in these countries, but there's a lot to be learned from the Turkish experience right. in terms of how regression happens and what you could get end up with right. so there's this i guess a comparative relevance of turkey which i will also uh, like scholars to get out of our trip yeah well i'll definitely say we've i'm speaking on behalf of all the scholars but the audience will get a chance to hear from some of the scholars in our next episode about this trip and what they're experiencing and and we'll be able to map what you've hoped and what and what they're pulling away from it as well but I'll say, at least from my perspective, all three of those things have come through in the trip from landing here to visiting our first organization um, with the Migrant Solidarity Association to to seeing our first historical sites, the Blue Mosque. Um, yeah, there's just been like a lot of opportunities for us to reflect and think about those things deeply. And yeah, I'm not, we probably won't remember every fact that our amazing tour guide Ali has given us over the past week, but I definitely believe it's like softened our hearts and understandings to to a place that it is of like vital importance to the world for its culture, its history, among a plethora of, of other things. So I just want to thank you for spending time with us, uh, both as a collective and and for taking time to sit in the lobby of our hotel in Chinakale to, to even share more for folks who might be interested in, in joining this program or who are already members of this community. So I just want to say uh, thank you for that, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And it's a pleasure to travel with you and your colleagues. Yeah, for sure. All right, guys. Next episode, you will be hearing from some of my fellow travel mates. We will talk a little bit about what we've been seeing, what we've been thinking about, and we'll see you over there. So thanks again, Dr. Aicha. Excited to spend the last day and some change with, with you and the rest of the crew. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> I'm really excited for the last two days of our trip and I'll be sad to see you go. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Imagine the World, where we hear from inspiring members of the KHS community who are making significant contributions in their respective fields, challenging the status quo, and pushing the boundaries of what is possible as they imagine the world they want to see. This podcast is sponsored by Knight Tennessee Scholars at Stanford University, a multidisciplinary, multicultural graduate fellowship program providing scholars with financial support to pursue graduate studies at Stanford while helping equip them to be visionary, courageous, and collaborative leaders who address complex challenges facing the world. Follow us on social media at Knight Hennessy and visit our website at kh.stanford.edu to learn more about the program and our community.